When I was growing up, when we moved to Monroe, where I lived for a long, long time, um, during the summer, I'd go down to one of our neighbors who had a raspberry patch and would pick berries, and I got acquainted with the boy, which is my, my age, um, and I found out they were Seventh-day Adventists, which at the time meant nothing to me. I just knew that they were a little different, and um, they went to church on Saturday, but, you know, for some reason, that there was no... That didn't really register with me. I, I liked playing with him because after we finished picking berries, we'd take these old truck tires or tractor tires, and there was kind of a re ravine on the other side of the raspberry patch and roll them down through all of the brush and, and the blackberry vines and everything. And it was, you know, typical boy thing. You like to see destruction. So to see those big tires rolling down the hill and crashing into the blackberry bushes and knocking them over. The only thing was it was fun rolling them down. But the flip side was we had to push them back up if we wanted a repeat performance. Anyway, years passed, Dick went, uh, and that was his name, went to a college. He went to, uh, went in the service, came back, was looking for something to do. And about that time, my dad w wanted to retire from a tire store that he had in Monroe. And somehow he started talking to Dick about it. And he said, why don't you come to work here and see if you like it? He says, if you'll come to work for me for a month, I'll come back and I'll work for you for two months. There was no money exchanged hands, but that was his way of doing it, and Dick decided to take him up on it. And I was very uh, uh, happy that he did because Dad was not, uh, getting at an age where he couldn't handle those big truck and tractor tires. Anyway, I've gone to him ever since for my tires every year I drive back there and have the studded tires put on the fall and have them taken off and exchanged for the regular tires in the spring. And I did do that partly out, out of gratitude for what he did to my dad. And I buy my tires there. And even though uh, it's very inconvenient still, I, like I say, it's just my way of uh, expressing gratitude for him. But well, he, to he told me one time, this was several years ago, about his younger daughter who had been going to college uh, in eastern Washington and had driven home for the Christmas vacation. She hadn't been driving very long, and she came over the crest of uh, Stevens Pass and started down on the west side. And I think there was kind of a curve right after you go over the crest and then kind of a long straight s stretch and a big sweeping curve right at the bottom. Well, somehow she was going too fast and she hit a patch, patch of ice and was spinning around and went out of control and the car went up and all of the snow that was pushed against the side of the road from the snow plow, it kind of acted like a ramp and she went right up over the guardrail didn't hold her and started rolling, and that car rolled about 800 feet to the bottom of the ravine. And she walked away from that with only a few bruises where the seat belts had, or the restraints had, you know, pulled on her when she was tumbling. And, and we both agreed that was an amazing miracle from God. There was no doubt about it. I'm going to leave that and come back to it a little later. You know, it's three weeks uh, until Pentecost. It's a little over a month since the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I'd like to do a little review. And this can go back for the prior month. It can go back for the prior year, decade, or however long we want to take it. Have your goals focused, or have they focused on the kingdom of God during this time? If not, what 
has been your top priority? Getting a better job or maybe getting a job for the first time or getting a job after having been out of work for a long time. Maybe it's finding a mate, losing weight, maybe planning for retirement. Or if you're very much of a sports enthusiast, maybe it's the Mariners now that the spring season has started, or all of the hype on the radio about the stadium that they're trying to build, either Key Arena, refurbish that, and, or put something down further south, and there's a lot of uh, news with regard to that. Or maybe you're thinking about vacations. A lot of us in the past, I know, my vacation was the feast, basically. I never, I, I had a lot of vacation uh, that was, ended up being about a month, but most of that was centered around going to the feast or the other holy days and that type of thing. So uh, it, it wasn't a vacation in the sense of you know, just going someplace for two weeks. Anyway, I want to clarify one thing. None of what I've mentioned, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of the things that, that I've mentioned. Basically, they are all um, necessary or desirable for us if we're going to lead a well-balanced life. But the caveat to that is if they start to intrude in any way on our focus of the kingdom of God, and if we get so out of balance that we're spending all of our time or an extraordinary amount of our time on any of these, it's time to maybe step back and review your entire picture and see if the time you spend in any given week, any given month, uh, any given year, um, see if there's a balance. Moving to a different subject, what about our mouth? You know, if our hammer hits our nail or hits the fing your finger and your nail at the same time, or if a wrench uh, slips while you're trying to tighten something and you scrape your knuckles as a result, do you let out a s stream of expletives or profanity that can be heard in the next county? Now, if anyone's going to be guilty of that, that would fall clearly with me. Because although I have in the past done a lot of things with my hands, I think the older I get, the less, the less accurate I am. What about euphemisms when we're talking about talking or our mouth? You know, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about this or them uh, anymore. So have we slipped back in the habit of saying gosh or gee or golly or some other uh, euphemism? You know, has our language become just a little too casual? What about the Sabbath? Do we quit work on Friday night? before sunset, and that's certainly not too much of a problem now with the days being longer, and, and uh, don't resume it until after Saturday night on sunset, you know. Or do we look at it with kind of a cavalier attitude and we're kind of nonchalant about our observance? And sometimes, People will think, well, I'm just sitting at a desk. I'm not really physically 
doing a lot of work that would be considered exertion. I'm not like the man in the Old Testament that was killed because he was out picking up sticks. If you look at that example, I'm just sitting at a desk and will try to rationalize or justify that uh, as long as it's not a physical exertion, that it's okay, that it won't make any difference. Do you view the Sabbath as a time to pray a little longer, to maybe study a little more and catch up on some of the things that you haven't been able to do during the week? Or in some cases, do you attend certain sports events or concerts or movies, reasoning that, hey, it's okay, I'm supposed to relax, and this is relaxing. I remember going to a Seventh-day Adventist dentist when I was down in um, Pasadena going to college, and a lot of the students went to him because he was close to the campus, and so he was familiar with them and their beliefs and this type of thing. But one day, while I was having an appointment, he made a point of telling me that he'd driven 800 miles the previous Sabbath, or that weekend, uh, to visit someone in his family. I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was almost like he was trying to justify that particular trip. And I think he did that because he knew that we kept the Sabbath. Now, if someone in the family is critically ill and is hospitalized and maybe is um, on the verge of dying and not expected to live, then I would say that's the kind of ox in a ditch that you might find occurring for someone taking that kind of a trip during that time. But anyway, um, you know, we should know when we're pushing the envelope when it comes to observing the Sabbath and the activities that we should be engaging in on the Sabbath. Do we lose our temper with our spouse, with our children, our co-workers, with our employees, if we're an employer, or with our boss? Is our temper under control? Or is it easy for us to fly off the handle at the slightest provocation, say things we don't mean and are sorry for later on and well just t to be sorry that we said them we're the type of people that will fly off the handle and you know think and then be sorry later have we gotten so, so mad have we been pushed so far that we've either either slap someone or perhaps uh, pushed someone in a moment of anger. And I don't mean an example where you're playing with someone. Uh, and the incident that comes to mind when I think of that is our house in Monroe was fairly good sized. When you came in the entry way, You'd go to the left to go through the living room, then around through the hall, back in the kitchen, and back to entry. So it is a fairly large circle. And when my children were young, I spent hours chasing them around that circle. And my grandchildren later on. I mean, we had a great deal of fun and had all kinds of games doing that. And occasionally, in our younger years, Veronica and I would chase each other. I mean, you know, it was all good-natured and in fun. Uh, she'd hit me 
I, or not hit me, but I mean, she'd tag me and take off, and I'd take off after her. Uh, one day, she went through the entryway ahead of me, and I closed the door behind me, thinking I'm going to stop her that way. And then I followed her around right on her heels, and she got to that door, and she slowed down and started to open it. And meanwhile, I was coming right behind, and somehow I stuck my right foot out, and at the same time, she stuck her foot over here to brace herself to pull the door, and my little toe was like this. I mean, it just went out. Anyway, I hobbled to the Sabbath, and Mr. Duncan, who was our minister, asked me what had happened. And we explained what had happened, and of course he couldn't contain himself. It was so amusing to him, he proceeded to tell everyone in the congregation about it during his sermon. The moral of that story is be sure you're careful about what you tell your minister. Other, other, <laughs> Uh, other than counseling, you know, we're bound by confidentiality not to share anything of a serious nature. But this wasn't good fun, and I, I laughed as much as everyone else. But I've never forgotten that, and Veronica hasn't either. But I'm not talking about that kind of slapping and pushing. I'm talking about the real thing where someone ends up with a bloody face or... Uh, you know, bruises all over their body. Have you forgiven everyone who's offended you this past month? Or is there a church member, a family member, someone that has said something or done something that really offended you and you're still seething about it because they didn't either make amends or apologize, or maybe it was done unknowingly on their part. What about relationships? The points I'm going to uh, give here date back to something that I did in 1987. So it's stale dated in one sense, it's 30 years old. But it was interesting to me that things really haven't changed much from them because the same problems that were prevalent at that time are still here today. Perhaps because they're even more you know, accentuated because of all the electronic devices and gadgets that we have that influence the things we do in our spare time. And we tend to have more spare time. But because of that, do these influence um, our thoughts? Do they influence our actions? The reason I mention the date is because the example I planned to give happened at that time. You know, in spite of all of the booklets and all of the articles and all of the sermons that have been preached about this, um, it, it, you know, if it occurred back at that time, it very likely could occur now. But I remember talking to a, men, a uh, member, a man, who said he always knew that adultery was wrong, but not fornication, because it wasn't specifically mentioned as one of the Ten Commandments. You know, I don't remember if he didn't understand what the word meant, but in case there is any doubt Today, if you want to go on the internet or go to a dictionary, uh, dictionary.com defines it, voluntary sexual 
intercourse between two unmarried persons or two persons not married to each other. So it's pl pretty clear what it is. And yet, I don't know how many years he'd been in the church, he still didn't understand the distinction or that it was wrong. And I'm not naive enough to believe that that same kind of thinking might still be prevalent today. Why did Paul admonish us in, and you can turn here, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Very, very specific, very, very direct, very, very emphatic, no doubt about what he means, flee fornication. There's no way you can misunderstand what that means. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. Now, I suppose that someone very new to the church for the first time, maybe perhaps not having any religious background at all, so consequently not having any knowledge about the Bible, and maybe, heard, or maybe having heard someone mention the Ten Commandments, may, that still may not have any relevance to them. And I can see, perhaps, that someone like that might have a legitimate excuse for not understanding what this was or what it was or how it um, interacted or interfaced with adultery. But that wasn't the case with the man that I'm talking about. He wasn't new. He'd been in the church for many, many years. And so that kind of excuse didn't wash. It didn't cut it. It wasn't very compelling. What about our thoughts? Are we above reproach when we are around other people? Or do we think, well, why can't I have someone strong and virile instead of my wimp of a husband? Like the wife that went into the police station to report her husband missing, and the sergeant asked for a description. And she said, well, he's about 6'4", tall, lean, muscular, very handsome, with a head of black, curly hair. And the sergeant interrupted her and said, you know, I know your husband, and he's not an inch over 5'8". He's going bald, and he has a pot belly. And she said, well, sure, but who wants him anyway? I mean, do you have that kind of attitude? Or conversely, men, are they looking for the Hollywood starlet type, not realizing that... Uh, their wife perhaps has, has had several children and maybe is going through menopause and having hormonal uh, reactions that affect her thinking, that affect the way she looks, that affect a lot of other things. And, you know, if you recall, and a number of you, I think, were married in the church, but in United Part of the ceremony says that you take your spouse in sickness and in health, in good times and in difficult times. That's pretty clear. It's pretty pervasive. It's pretty all-encompassing. It's not for the weekend. It's not a throwaway marriage. If it doesn't work out, we'll just go to Vegas or Reno. But that is the way a lot of people think today. I mean, we're affected by our society. We're affected by the people around us. We're affected by the news media. We're affected by movies and television. Anyway, we may 
never verbalize what we think, but nonetheless do these kind of thoughts, is that kind of thinking roll around in our gray matter? What about the books or the magazines that we read? Do we read um, risque magazines or questionable uh, books or go to movies that are R-rated or, you know, watch the soaps or TV programs to help put, quote, romance, unquote, back in our lives? You know, there's a certain um, amount of that is not... I mean, it's kind of borderline, but if it's a steady diet, then there's something going on, there's something wrong, and there's something that if you're going to evaluate your own life that you need to really thoroughly examine. Have we taken something that didn't belong to us this past month? Perhaps a sick day when we weren't really sick but we just wanted the time off to do something of a, a personal nature. Now, don't get me wrong. There are certainly legitimate times if someone is emotionally drained because of severe personal problems or a, some kind of stress in their life where they really need some time away from work to recharge, to um, kind of regroup. But make sure that it's warranted before we mark it as a sick day. How about long coffee breaks, long lunches, excessive use of the company phone for personal calls, making or marking, I should say, incorrect time on our time cards, taking tools home, pencils and paper uh, for personal use, using the company's postal system to mail personal items, that type of thing. Now, a lot of companies and now, I think, are a little more liberal with the use of their vacation days and time, and they don't, some of them don't even make a distinction between what is sick and what is time for personal reasons. But if there is a distinction, then how do you use those days and that time? Are our tax records accurate? Is our yay, yay, and our nay, nay. Do we embellish stories we tell to make them more tantalizing or more interesting? Do we pass on a story that tears down someone's reputation instead of building it up? Do we enjoy gossip? Can we feel our ears burn with delight when someone drops a juicy morsel of information in our lap? You know, you've probably either seen this in real life or in the movies or in pictures of those candid moments when mama bird comes back to the nest with a worm for the babies. And you look at the nest and here are four or five or six little birds and the only thing you can see in the, in the nest is mouths wide open. They're, they're waiting to be fed as, as though they're saying, feed me, feed me. Is that what our attitude is, do we have that expectant attitude when we hear some juicy tibbet? Oh, really, tell me more, you know? Is that what we, is that how we react to some kind of 
gossip? What have we been focused on this past month that maybe belongs to someone else? Have we been eyeing our neighbor's new car or the new house they've moved into or maybe wondering about our best friend's new job, envious of that? Have we been focused on our looks and we're really ready for that tummy tuck or facelift? Now, I'm sure that's probably not a focus of a lot of people, but it can be. How to preserve our looks. Veronica and I used to be interested when we saw a certain Hollywood celebrity who was a very prominent figure on the red carpet during the Oscars. Late in her life, she got a facelift, but it got lifted so high, her eyebrows were about an inch above where they should have been, and it totally distorted her face. Um, we felt sorry for her, but it served, at least to us, as a good example of the consequences that can occur when we go to extreme measures to maintain a certain physical image beyond our youth when we looked more appealing. You know, and here again, don't get me wrong, there's certainly nothing wrong in trying to keep ourselves in shape by exercising, doing the kind of exercises that are sensible for whatever our age bracket is. Uh, if we're in our 90s not trying to run a, you know, a mile and whatever number of seconds is the record now, but eating sensibly and exercising what we can if it's only walking. When we start looking at quick fixes, you know, we may regret the outcome we may end up reaping some pretty traumatic results, as in my previous example. When was the last time we told our mom or our dad, I love you, if ever? You know, if we're grown adults now, how often do we write or call or visit our parents? Now, those of us who are older, uh, many of us have none, but what about the single parents or elderly people in the congregation, the widows, the widowers, right here? When was the last time we picked up the phone to say hello? You know, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I noticed you haven't been to church the last several Sabbaths, and I wanted to say hello and see how you were and to see if you needed anything. Is there anything I can do for you? You know, most of these things never take a lot of time. A phone call, it doesn't have to be long, maybe it could be three or four or five minutes, it makes all the difference in the world. And like I say, uh, it usually doesn't take a lot of time. If, for example, your parents are in another part of the country and you have to uh, travel a long distance to see them, you might try to, and I think many of us have done this in the past, uh, try to incorporate a visit by going to a feast site in that general area so you can either stop before the feast or after the feast. Do you still treat your parents with respect and listen to their advice, even if they're not in the church? You know, tomorrow is Mother's Day, and if your mother or your stepmother or your grandmother is still alive, is this 
the only time of the year you do anything for them? That may be a pretty accurate and telling measure of the importance you place for them, uh, place on them when it comes to your life. Now, I didn't say anything at first when I started, and you may have picked up on it during the course of this, but I pretty well touched all of the Ten Commandments without ever going to them specifically, even though I didn't talk about them in chronological order. You know, it's pretty comprehensive review. However, if we feel that none, none of these examples have applied to us in any way, then it probably would be a good idea to turn to Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6, where we're told, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. You know, if you think about Job's example, and I'm not going to turn there because you are very conversant with it, very familiar with it. What was he criticized for at the end of Job? Well, for being self-righteous. He couldn't understand why all of these things were happening to him until God revealed it to him. And God here is telling us our righteousness, the things that we do that we think are righteous in his eyes are as filthy rags, kind of rags you find people living on who are out on the street. Anyway, we begin to think, you know, anytime we begin to think, well, you know, I'm pretty good in thinking about the things you've talked about here today. I stand up pretty well against the examples that were given. You know, if we start thinking that way, there may be big trouble on our horizon because self-righteousness may be starting to creep in, and that is when you need to go back and read this particular verse. You know, some of our current problems are the result of some of the things that we did in the past, the past month, the past year, the past decade. Some of them go back to the time we were in high school or college or in military service. Some of those things have such a um, deep and penetrating effect on our bodies and our minds that they influence, influence us for the rest of our lives. You know, at the beginning, I mentioned the example of my friend's daughter and the miracle that happened to her on Stephen's Pass surrounding her accident. Well, we all experience a miracle in our lives every day. You know, it may not be as spectacular as hers was, but it's the miracle of God's forgiveness for when we don't quite measure up. And when I say we don't quite measure up to any of the things I've discussed, any one or even close to one, if we don't measure up, God still forgives us. He warns us, however, not to take that forgiveness casually, not to take it lightly. If we have the right attitude in spite of our imperfections or weaknesses or our flaws, and we all have them. They're all different. Uh, 
not any one of us has the same kind of problems as anyone else in this room. They may be similar, maybe some are somewhat identical, but if you take a cross-section of any congregation, you're going to find problems throughout with everyone to a certain degree. And that's not to make anyone feel, um, you know, discouraged or, or put down or anything like that. It's just factual. It's a matter of fact. God called all of us. He knew that. He knew what we were like. He knew our weaknesses. But he's working with all of us. And that is the absolute miracle that in spite of the things that we do, in spite of where we fall short, in spite of all of our limitations, that he performs this miracle of forgiveness in our lives. He not only forgives, but he forgets. So we can start each day anew with renewed hope, with renewed inspiration. We hope we won't stumble again, but when it happens, and it will. He knows that. You know that. You ask for forgiveness about something, and a week later, maybe you do the identical thing again because of weakness or because of something else. But he's teaching us. He's training us. He's allowing us that latitude if we have the right attitude um, and provided that we're willing and provided that we truly repent when we do something like that. Turn to Psalm 103, verse 12. Psalms 103, verse 12, which to me is a very, very encouraging verse. Uh, we're told, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. You know, this verse is valid at any time. I think if you think about it, if we're standing on a line of latitude facing the equator and we put our right arm out, that's going to the west, and if we put our left arm out, that's going to the east. Here on earth, if that line followed the curvature of the earth and went around, it would eventually meet. But God says the lines that define east and west, in my thinking, are not the same. When you put your hand out here and you say west, that goes out quadrillions of light years or however you can define the edge or the end of eternity and similarly when you put your left hand out there's no end it doesn't end that is a kind of forgiveness he offers us and that is the way he views our sins he doesn't remember them he forgets them entirely they're gone you know, we come to services here every Sabbath to hear God's message uh, and measure our progress against the template of his law. We're shown where we've fallen short. We've touched on some issues that might affect some of you. I know affect some of you. Not because I know them specifically, because in any congregation, you have these types of things occurring. We're showing where we've fallen short, how and why it occurred. We then have the opportunity with the help of God's Holy Spirit to make those changes, which will help us correct our errors with the hope they will not be repeated again. This is all against the backdrop of the ongoing forgiveness God has toward us. 
And that, brethren, is the greatest miracle of all.